Hey, everybody. This is Alicia Purdy, publisher of The Way of the Worshipper. Welcome to my YouTube channel. I'm reading the Bible through in a year. Today is day 180 of our one-year Bible reading plan. I'm glad that you're with me today. Today, as day 180, I woke up this morning thinking in my heart, today is the day of the total turnaround. That's what's going to happen. The situation is going to turn around. We believe that in faith in our lives today, day 180. So we celebrate day 180. I always celebrate the 180s, the day of the total turnaround. Whatever trajectory you're on, if it's the wrong direction, just turn around and go the other direction. If there's something you're believing that God will turn around for you, you can put your trust in him. He is the God of the 180. We just saw in our last couple of days reading that even when we're surrounded by enemies on every single side, the Lord made the Arameans, they were coming against God's people, the nation of Israel, and even the king of Israel, who wasn't even following God, when he cried out to God, God in his mercy, caused those Arameans to be confounded, confused, and terrified, and they did a total 180, and that was victory for God's people. So celebrating today, day 180, the day of the turnaround. Make sure you check out the resources I have linked below to the wayoftheworshipper.com, where I do journalism-style devotional blogs, where you can go do deeper studies and dives into God's word, where I've explored topics that relate to worship the human condition, all kinds of things we experience in our emotions changes nothing about God. He's still good. We turn our faces to God, not our backs. And you know what? Life happens. God is a God filled with mercy. And we saw in the old covenant that in the old Testament, all through the stories that in the books of the Mosaic law, that the testimony, the Ark of the testimony was covered by mercy, the symbols of mercy. Your testimony is one of God's mercy. Okay. So if you haven't already subscribed to the way of the worshipers, YouTube channel, take a minute, please. And do that. That would be such an awesome thing. You and I partnering together in the gospel. It really matters. Just something so small. The little, there's a little bell. It gives you a notification when new content comes out. We're still in the middle, almost at, almost at the halfway point, actually, of reading the Bible through in a year. And Leave a comment below if you'd like to do that. I would love to read them. I love reading the comments. Sometimes I get up in the morning and I read comments that people have made. And it's such an encouragement to me personally. So I appreciate you taking the time to do that. And if you haven't already liked this video at the top, make sure you like it at the end to complete each day's reading. Check. Okay, let's open with a word of prayer. Thank you, Heavenly Father, for this day. Thank you for the reading of your word. Father, we believe that you are the God of the turnaround. There isn't any situation that you can't turn around for our good and for your glory. We lift our hands to your name right now. You're the name that's above every name. Name it. You're above it. Father, we lay aside every weight and every sin that would beset us right now so we can focus on reading your word. Lord, come and have your way. We partner in faith with your word. We thank you for the living, active, powerful word of your son, Jesus Christ, who is alive. Thank you, Father. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Okay, let's get right into today's reading. We are reading today 2 Kings chapter 13 and 14. We're kind of in the middle of a bunch of wars and switching around of the kings of the northern and southern kingdom of God's people. That's um, Judah and Israel. I haven't had coffee yet. And um, when we last read Joash... He was the boy king. He was instituted. Um, he was anointed in secret when there was a lot of turmoil in the kingdom through Adaliah, his wicked grandmother, um, descendants of Ahab, who are still causing a lot of trouble. Jehu, the king, he tore down the altars of Baal, but he didn't do a completed work, even though he had zeal for the Lord. And so the last thing we read was Joash, who was the boy king. He's now grown up. And um, he died and his son Amaziah reigned in his place. And there is a king also in the Aramean kingdom right now. And that is Hazael who murdered the king that was in his place, Ben-Hadad. They were all enemies of God's people and they constantly, constantly bring trouble. God said it would be so because of choices made by kings who had gone before them, like David and like Solomon. So here we're picking it up now in 2 Kings chapter 13. In the 23rd year of Joash, the son of Ahaziah, king of Judah, Jehoahaz, the son of Jehu, reigned over Israel in Samaria for 17 years. He did evil well, in the sight of the Lord and followed the sins of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, who caused Israel to sin. He did not turn aside from them. 
The anger of the Lord was kindled against Israel, so he gave them into the hand of Hazael, the king of Aram, and into the hands of Ben-Hadad, the son of Hazael, all their days. But Jehoahaz appeased the Lord, and the Lord listened to him, for he saw the oppression of Israel, because the king of Aram oppressed them. So the Lord gave Israel a savior, so that they got out from under the hand of Aram. Then the children of Israel dwelt in their tents as before. Nevertheless, they did not turn aside from the sins of the house of Jeroboam, who caused Israel to sin, but walked in them. The Asherah pole also stood in Samaria. So Jehoahaz had only 50 horsemen, 10 chariots, and 10,000 footmen left, for the king of Aram had destroyed them and made them like the dust at threshing. Now the rest of the deeds of Jehoahaz and all that he did in his power, were they not written in the books of the annals of the kings of Israel? And Jehoahaz slept with his fathers and they buried him in Samaria. Joash, his son, reigned in his place. So we have a couple of names that go back and forth. Here are some very similar names. I was saying the other day that I think of it like the name John. It's a common name. And so sometimes we see that here, Joash. Jehoahash. We see some some different people, but they're they're actually different kingdoms that are rising up. But also remember that these kingdoms, the kingdom of Judah and the kingdom of Israel, are starting to blend. Is, Judah's been doing okay on its own, following the ways of David, Solomon, and Rehoboam. But through the Bible keeps bringing up here that there's Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, that's who split the kingdom um, after Solomon had died. But now, and they followed the way, horrible ways. They did not walk in the way of the Lord. They were evil. And Ahab was the most evil king who had reigned before any, any who had come before him. That's what the Bible records in Second Kings. However, now they're starting to blend together in their faith traditions and the way that they're expressing, because remember, the presence of the Lord was dwelling in Jerusalem, but the kingdom of Israel, their capital city was Samaria. So they were worshiping in, in an apostasy. They were they did not honor what the Lord said, that he wanted his temple to dwell in Jerusalem. So we're seeing some inter-switching of names now as they're all naming their children after each other as different kings are rising up. Okay, so in the 37th year of Joash, king of Judah, Jehoash, the son of Jehoaz, reigned over Israel in Samaria for 16 years. He did evil in the sight of the Lord. He did not turn aside from all the sins of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, who caused Israel to sin, but walked in them. The rest of the deeds of Joash, all that he did and his power with which he fought against Amaziah, king of Judah, are they not written in the book of the annals of the kings of Israel? So, Joash slept with his fathers, and Jeroboam sat on his throne. Joash was buried in Samaria with the kings of Israel. So here we're seeing another names come back again, another Jeroboam. That's a big red flag. In fact, I'm going to underline here. We see just earlier, it's been recorded that Jeroboam, this is the line I'm going to underline. I like to pay attention to these, these little words and these parathetical statements that come in here, because the Lord holds accountable people who cause other people to sin. In the New Testament, that's called a stumbling block. Here in the Old Testament, they keep referring over and over the house. So nevertheless, they did not turn aside from the sins of the house of Jeroboam, who caused Israel to sin. That's what I'm underlining here, who caused Israel to sin. The Lord really does over and over in this Old Testament accounts shows that it was Jeroboam who caused Israel to sin. I'm sure, the people sinned over and over again, but when a leader causes people to sin, they cause people to stumble. It's a different level of accountability. And I've noticed throughout our readings over and over, this keeps coming up. They keep blaming all the way back. It was Jeroboam. It was Jeroboam. It was Jeroboam. And because of him, we're here now. Now, there could be some chain breakers that come along the way. These people don't have to be victims. They have a choice to make just like everybody else does to walk in the ways of the Lord. They could have relocated. They could have left the nation of Israel and gone over into Judah and worshiped in some, in the um, capital city of Jerusalem. They didn't choose to do that and easier said than done, but he caused Israel to sin. That keeps coming up. So just keep that in the back of your mind. Okay. So here we are now, the death of Elisha. Now, Elisha had become sick with the illness of which he would die. So Joash, the king of Israel, went down to him and wept before him and said, My father, my father, the chariot of Israel and its horsemen. Elisha said to him, Take a bow and arrows. 
So he took a bow and arrows. Then he said to the king of Israel, draw the bow. So he drew it. Elisha put his hands on the king's hands. Then he said, open the east window. So he opened it. Then Elisha said, shoot. So he shot. Then he said, the arrow of the deliverance of the Lord, the arrow of the deliverance from Aram. You must strike Aram in Aphek until you have destroyed them. Then he said, take the arrows. So he took them. Then he said to the king of Israel, strike the ground. So he struck it three times and stood there. Then the man of God was angry with him and said, you should have struck it five or six times. Then you would have stricken Aram until you had finished them. Now you will strike Aram just three times. So Elisha died and they buried him. Now Moabite raiders would enter the land in the spring. As they were burying a man, they saw raiders. So they threw the man into the tomb of Elisha. When the man touched the bones of Elisha, he came to life and stood on his feet. Now Hazael, king of Aram, oppressed Israel all the days of Jehoahaz, but the Lord was gracious to them. Well, let's underline that word. The Lord, so what a kind Lord that he is. And I I don't judge them per se. I see myself in here. I see all the times that I missed the mark. And the Lord was gracious to me, like he was to them, and had compassion on them. That's a promise that the Lord made all the way back in the earliest days of the covenant when he said of himself, the Lord said, behold, the Lord is gracious, full of compassion and extending mercy to the generations. He said those are his own words. And those words are reiterated. I, I didn't even count. We should count someday. How many times the Lord, people that record, talk about the Lord using his own words that he's gracious. We read it yesterday in one of our Psalms, gracious, full of compassion, full of mercy. So now here we are in Second Kings. The Lord was gracious to them. He had compassion on them. That's our God. That's his true nature. He told us that himself. He turned toward them because of his covenant with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and would not yet destroy them or cast them from his presence. Then Hazael, the king of Aram, died, and Ben-Hadad, his son, reigned in his place. Now Jehoahash and the son of Jehoahaz took back the cities from Ben-Hadad, the son of Hazael, that had been taken from Jehoahaz, his father, in war. Three times Joash struck him. And we covered the cities of Israel. So that's the end of 2 Kings chapter 13. Here's what's something very interesting. Here's one of those blink and you miss it little nuances in our scripture. Hazael, the king of Aram, he, which is a, now it's called Syria today. Back a couple chapters ago, we saw that Hazael murdered the king, Ben-Hadad. Isn't that odd that he named his son after the man that he murdered? And one more thing that's worth noting. Elisha had asked Elijah for a double portion of his anointing, of that mantle that he gave him. And he said, oh, that's a really hard thing. But and he gave him a, little, a sign and said, if this sign happens, then we'll know that God has given you that double portion. Well, he did. So when you count the miracles and wonders that Elisha did, Elijah did seven major miracles. Elisha, by the time he died, had only done 13 miracles. Well, double would be 14. Guess what? After he was dead, this death where the dead man's bones were thrown, this a body was thrown into the cave where Elisha's dead body was. The man touched the bones of Elisha and he came to life and stood on his feet. I just want to encourage you today. It is literally never too late with God. Just like we saw when Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead, it's not too late. So when Mary and Martha cried out and said, oh, if you had been here, my brother wouldn't have died. What they should have said is, the Lord is here. Now my brother can live. Changing in our perspective. That's the 180 for today. Let's do a 180 in our perspective instead of a hopelessness that it's over or it's dead or it's gone. Don't give up. Do a 180 in your perspective. Go toward the Lord. Lord, I need you in your presence because when you're here, Lord, it's never too late. I don't care what's dead. 
if God needs to bring it to life to accomplish his purpose, that's what he's going to do. He has a plan. I don't know what that looks like for you. I don't know what it looks like for me, but I'm going to tell you right now. And I'm speaking from faith in my own life in this moment. I believe that it's never too late with God. God doesn't live by man's deadlines. He lives by his own. So 13 miracles, Elisha was not, had died. Was God's word not true? Nope. God's word is still true. There's miracle number 14. All right, let's continue in 2 Kings chapter 14. Oh, in the second year of Joash, son of Jehoahaz, king of Israel, Amaziah, the son of Joash, king of Judah, became king. He was 25 years old when he became king and reigned 29 years in Jerusalem. His mother's name was Jehoadon from Jerusalem. He did what was right in the sight of the Lord, only not like David, his father. But he did not remove the high places. Still, the people sacrificed and made offerings on the high places. As soon as he seized the kingdom, he killed his servants who had killed his father, the king. But he did not kill the children of the murderers, according to what was written in the books of the law of Moses, in which the Lord commanded. Fathers must not be put to death for the children, nor children be put to death for the fathers. Rather, a man should be put to death for his own sin. Remember that God did God did a 180 when he created his culture, his kingdom on earth, and he chose his people and he created the laws of holiness, the laws of separateness, the laws of distinction from the way that the world worked. This was totally different. Everybody else was wiping out the fathers, the sins of the fathers were heaped upon the children, et cetera, et cetera. Now, in God's kingdom, he did a 180. Fathers must not be put to death for the children, nor children be put to death for the fathers. Rather, a man should be put to death for his own sin. So we're not talking here about the way that he's treating an enemy. That's not the same thing. God's promises, provision, his precepts and principles, they don't apply to the world. He's talking about the way this civilization, God's kingdom, treats each other. Yes, there is war. Yes, there is ugliness. There is infighting. There are battles between family members in the two different kingdoms of Judah and Israel. But he honored the word of the Lord that where he fathers must not put to death the children or children put to death, be put to death for fathers. Rather, a man would be put to death for his own sin. Remember, we'd look at those nuances and see that's in the kingdom. So, he struck 10,000 Edomites in the Valley of Salt and captured Selah in battle. He called it Jokthiel, as it is to this day. Then Amaziah sent messengers to Jehoash, the son of Jehoahaz, the son of Jehu, the king of Israel, saying, Come, let us look one another in the face. Then Jehoash, the king of Israel, sent word to Amaziah, king of Judah, saying, The thorn bush in Lebanon said to the cedar in Lebanon, Give your daughter to my son for a wife. But a wild animal passed through in Lebanon and trampled the thorn bush. You have indeed struck Edom, and your heart has lifted you up. Enjoy respect and sit at home. Why stir up trouble and fall, you and Judah with you? But Amaziah would not listen. So Jehoash, the king of Israel, which is the larger kingdom, he gave him an opportunity to make a different choice. Jehoash, the king of Israel, went up, and he and Amaziah, king of Judah, looked one another in the face at Beth Shemesh, which belongs to Judah. Judah was beaten before Israel, and every man fled to his tent. Jehoash, king of Israel, captured Amaziah, king of Judah, the son of Jehoash, the son of Ahaziah at Beth Shemesh. Then he came to Jerusalem and breached the wall of Jerusalem from the gate of Ephraim to the corner gate, 400 cubits. He took all the gold and silver, all the vessels found in the house of the Lord and in the treasuries of the king's house and hostages and returned to Samaria. Now the rest of the deeds Jehoash, Jehoash did and his power, and how he fought with Amaziah, king of Judah, are they not written in the books of the annals of the kings of Israel? So Jehoash slept with his fathers and was buried in Samaria with the kings of Israel. Jeroboam, his son, reigned in his place. Amaziah, the son of Joash, king of Judah, lived 15 years after the death of Jehoash, son of Jehoaz, king of Israel. And the rest of the deeds of Amaziah, are they not written in the writ in the book of the annals of the kings of Judah? They made a conspiracy against him in Jerusalem, and he fled to Lachish, and they sent after him to Lachish and killed him there. 
They carried him on horses and he was buried in Jerusalem with his fathers in the city of David. All the people of Judah took Azariah, who was 16 years old, and made him king instead of his father, Amaziah. He built Elath and restored it to Judah after the king slept with his fathers. In the 15th year of Amaziah, the son of Joash, king of Judah, Jeroboam, my Bible calls him Jeroboam II in my little title at the top of this section. Jeroboam, this is not the same person as Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, who caused Israel to sin, but seems to be a namesake of some kind. Jeroboam, the son of Joash, king of Israel, became king in Samaria for 41 years. He did evil in the sight of the Lord and did not turn aside from all the sins of Jeroboam, son of Nebat, who caused Israel to sin. He restored the border of Israel from the entrance of Labo Hamath to the sea of Arabah, according to the word of the Lord God of Israel, which he spoke by his servant Jonah, the son of Amittai, the prophet who was from Gath Hefer. For the Lord saw the very bitter affliction of Israel. There was no one left, imprisoned or free, and no helper for Israel. The Lord had not said that he would wipe out the name of Israel from under heaven. So he saved them by the hand of Jeroboam, son of Joash. Now the rest of the deeds of Jeroboam, all that he did in his power and how he fought and how he recovered for Israel, Damascus and Hamath, which had belonged to Judah, are they not written in the books of the annals of the kings of Israel? Jeroboam slept with his fathers with the kings of Israel. Zechariah, his son, reigned in his place. Okay. That's the end of our reading in the book of Second Kings, continuing on in the Game of Thrones, but now involved in a civil war, the Brotherhood Kingdoms of Judah and Israel. Okay, well, let's go over into the New Testament. Reading today, Acts 18, 23 through 19, 12. When we last left off, Paul is on his missionary journeys. He is traveling to all kinds of cities that we're later going to get letters to, Philippi and Ephesus, and he is now in Corinth. And he had to shake his um, garments out because the Jews there would not receive him. And he says something really key. So Paul is an interesting, very nuanced person. We're all nuanced, but sometimes the Bible doesn't give us the deeper insight into the mindsets and personalities of the people that we read in the Bible. And as a, as a writer and a journalist and a storyteller, I often crave more details. I want to know the deeper story, the backstory, the side stories. However, Paul is one that we get a lot of information about. And so not only was he a Jew, he was a Pharisee, he was a knowledgeable and learned man. He was a Roman citizen. So he, we saw that he had been able to dispute amongst the philosophers. He was able to quote their own poetry to them. We are all God's children. People are still saying that today. He quoted with the, he contended with the Stoics. And so now he's been in Corinth. He's bringing Christ, the knowledge of Christ to the Jews. Some are receiving Christ. Others are completely rejecting the idea that a Messiah has already come. And so Paul has been using the books of the laws and the prophets in order to contend with them. But when he's in Corinth, he's done. So he shakes out his garments and says this really key phrase, I will now go to the Gentiles. From now on, I'm going to the Gentiles. And that's what he does. He's not having a great time there either. He keeps returning to Antioch and he keeps being whipped and jailed and people are mistreating him. But the Holy Spirit is guiding him, blocking him from going to, into Asia. We saw the other day and the Holy Spirit is um, leading him into different regions where he's going to spread the gospel. Doesn't mean it's been very easy for him, but he is sent and he's being obedient to that. I really enjoy reading more about Paul's account and Luke. Luke does a great job in the book of Acts with providing some of those deeper details, but I still want more. Okay, let's get into Acts chapter 18, starting in verse 23. Paul has just returned to Antioch and he's lecturing with the Jews in the synagogue. After spending some time there, he departed and passed through the entire region of Galatia and Phrygia in sequence, strengthening all the disciples. Meanwhile, a Jew named Apollos, born in Alexandria, who was an eloquent man, and powerful in the scriptures came to Ephesus. This man was instructed in the ways of the Lord, knowing only the baptism of John, but being fervent in spirit. He accurately spoke and taught the things concerning the Lord. He began to speak boldly in the synagogue when Aquila and Priscilla heard him. They took him and explained the way of God more accurately. When Apollos intended to pass into Achaia, the brothers wrote to encourage the disciples to welcome him. On arriving, he greatly helped those who had believed through grace, for he vehemently refuted the Jews, 
publicly proving from the scriptures that Jesus was the Christ. Now we're in Acts chapter 19. While Apollos was at Corinth, Paul passed through the upper regions and came to Ephesus. He found some disciples and said to them, have you received the Holy Spirit since you believed? So Paul's not talking about salvation. He's saying, since you believed, these are believers. This is the second work of the Holy Spirit, like we saw on the day of Pentecost. They said to him, no, we have not even heard there is a Holy Spirit. And he said to them, into what then were you baptized? And they said, into John's baptism. Paul said, John indeed baptized with the baptism of repentance, telling the people that they should believe in the one coming after him, that is Christ Jesus. When they heard this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. When Paul laid his hands on them, the Holy Spirit came on them and they spoke in other tongues and prophesied. Yes and amen. There were about 12 men and in all. He went into the synagogue and spoke boldly for three months, lecturing and persuading concerning the kingdom of God. But when some were hardened and did not believe, but spoke evil of the way before the crowd, he withdrew from them and took the disciples lecturing daily in the school of Tyrannus. This continued for two years so that all who lived in Asia heard the word of the Lord Jesus, both Jews and Greeks. God worked powerful miracles by the hands of Paul. So handkerchiefs or aprons he had touched were brought to the sick and the diseases left them and the evil spirits went out of them. Kind of reminds me of when Jesus, when the woman touched the hem of Jesus's garment, the, that anointing was there. And here we see it here. Okay, that's the end of our reading in the book of Acts. I love that we're seeing here that there's a difference. The Bible makes a distinction between the Holy Spirit being in you and the Holy Spirit being on you. There are two different works and you can have both. We want to come, like Paul said, not just with wise and persuasive words, but with a demonstration of the Spirit's power. And hey, keep this in mind. If God's still alive, so are all his words. Yes and amen. It's all applicable and alive and well still today. Let's walk in power. We need more of that dunamis power light in the darkness. Okay, let's finish up in the book of Psalms and Proverbs. Reading today, Psalm chapter 146. So many times I wish we could do a Bible study, but we're just reading the Bible through in a year. It's a separate thing. That's why I have resources linked down below so you can continue forward. And I have my own personal devotions separate from reading the Bible through in a year. But you know what? When we get God's word into our heart and it stirs faith, even for the impossible, maybe there's something you thought was impossible. Well, guess what? Today's the day of one. We're day 180. Today's the day of the total turnaround. And we see that with Jews who are getting saved, they're completely changing their mindset when they hear about faith in the Lord. Maybe today is your 180 in the perspective of the work of the Holy Spirit. Let's see what the Psalms have. Let's see what the 180 holds today. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Oh, my soul. While I live, I will praise the Lord. I will sing praises unto my God while I have my life. Do not put your trust in princes, nor in the son of man in whom there is no help. There's a 180 for you right there. Let's read that again. Total 180 from the way the world works. Do not put your trust in princes, nor in the son of man in whom there is no help. His breath leaves him and returns to the earth. On that very day, his plans perish. Blessed is he who has the God of Jacob for his help, whose hope is in the Lord his God, who made heaven and earth, the sea and all that's in them, who keeps faithfulness forever, who executes justice for the oppressed, who gives food to the hungry. The Lord releases prisoners. The Lord opens the eyes of the blind. The Lord raises up those who are brought down. The Lord loves righteousness. The Lord preserves the sojourners. He lifts up the fatherless and the widow, but on the way of the wicked, he brings disaster. The Lord shall reign forever. Your God, O Zion, unto all generations, praise you, the Lord. That Hebrew word for praise is the Hebrew word halal. It's where we get the word hallelujah. It's not just a word we say when we say, oh, hallelujah to the Lord. It's actually a command. When, and that's more accurate the way it says here, praise you, the Lord. It's a command to shout hallelujah. The way that I put it on the way of the worshiper, just based on my journalism digging into the God's word, I've noticed that when people cry out hallelujah, or they give the command to halal the Lord, 
it's in response to his mighty acts or in the chapter where they're saying hallelujah, there's a recounting of the mighty acts of the Lord. So the way of the worshipers official statement on that is his help deserves halal. I have those, I have seven Hebrew words for praise bookmarks. You can tuck in your Bible. They're available on Etsy. They're linked down below through the way of the worshiper to keep in mind the reasons why the contextual reasons why we halal the Lord. We don't just shout hallelujah. Did you know that? We don't just do it because it's done. We shout hallelujah to the Lord in response to his mighty acts. So if there's something God's done in your life, or you just want to think about testimonies you heard from other believers, add your hallelujah. Praise you, the Lord. All right, let's go over it and finish up with a proverb. Reading today, Proverbs 18, verses 2 and 3. A fool has no delight in understanding, but in expressing his own heart. When the wicked comes, then also comes contempt. And with dishonor, reproach. I'm going to underline that, the first verse, verse two. I really like that, that a fool has no delight in understanding. So the one of the themes of the book of Proverbs is in all your wisdom, in all your knowledge, get understanding. The Bible distinguishes between knowledge and understanding. Knowledge is empty. You can just rattle off facts all day. Do you understand them? Can you apply them? Can you perceive them when they are coming towards you? Do you know how to distinguish what the world would say, the world's knowledge between the understanding of the Lord? That's what the book of Proverbs sets up. So I like this. A fool has no delight in understanding. A fool would want a lot of knowledge, but they don't want understanding. They just want to express their own heart. Blah, 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 blah. That's what the Bible would say. I just paraphrased it. All right, that's the end of our reading today. And there's a 180 for you right there in Proverbs 18 too. All right, that is it. Day 180 of our one-year Bible reading plan, all done. The day of the turnaround. Let hope arise. Let your faith arise. Ask God to show you a completely different perspective of what you're going through right now, a 180 perspective. Today's the day to do that. I'm Alicia Purdy, publisher of The Way of the Worshipper. Hit the thumbs up button beneath this video to accomplish it for today. And if you haven't subscribed already, please take a minute and do that. That would be awesome. It's a great way for you and I to advance the gospel together. Co-laborers in Christ. Resources below if you want them or need them. I love sharing this stuff with other believers. We are stronger together. Let's close in a word of prayer. Thank you, Heavenly Father, for this day. You are the God of the turnaround, the God of miracles and wonders. I believe every word you say is true even if I can't see it, even if I don't feel it, even if it looks dead already. Father, we know the turnaround is you bring the dead to life, dead hopes and dreams, dead people, dead thoughts, dead situations, Lord, that we thought were impossible. You said, you said, for what is impossible with man is possible with God. You are the God of the turnaround. We believe that and apply our faith to all that we've read today. Right now, situations are turning around. Help us to see that turnaround in faith, Lord, and we lift our hands to you and worship you for it. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. All right, I'll see you tomorrow. Bye.